the fourth. About 12 o'clock, I went to the emperor's apartment. He took a good lesson of English and Telemachus. He resolved to take up my method again. He approves of it, he said, and derives great benefit from it. He observed that he thought I had excellent dispositions for being a very good schoolmaster. I told him it was the fruit of my experience. He then made me enter into a great many details respecting the time when I gave lessons in London during my emigration, and he was very much amused by them. However, said he, you gentlemen must have done credit to the profession, if not by your learning, at least by your manners. I then told him that one of our princes had taught mathematics during his emigration, and this alone, said he with animation, would make a man of him and show him to have possessed some merit. That is assuredly one of the greatest triumphs of Madame de Genlis. I then related to him the following curious anecdote, which I heard on that subject. The prince was in Switzerland, and being so circumstanced as to find it advisable to conceal his existence, he wished to take a name that might favor his disguise. One of our bishops of the south of France fancied that nothing could be better than to give him the name of a young man from Languedoc then at Nisma, who was a very zealous Protestant, which was just as it ought to be, the prince being in a Protestant canton. The bishop added that there was no appearance that the young man would ever be in the way to falsify the prince's assumption of his name. But it had so happened that the young man had got into the army and had become an aide-de-camp to Monsieur de Montesquieu, and that shortly after he had emigrated precisely into Switzerland with his general. What was his surprise to find himself at the tabla d'ota at dinner with a person of his own name of the same religion and who belonged to the same town? It was quite like the scene of the two associates. But the best of the joke was that the young man had also changed his name and carefully concealed himself. Such incidents are only to be met with in novels. They are thought of impossible currents. Perhaps the present story has been rather embellished, yet I think I can affirm that I heard it from the young man himself. But, observed the emperor afterwards, those amongst you emigrants who had found resources abroad must have found themselves quite lost when they returned to France and ruined once more. Certainly, sire, for we found nothing of what we had formerly left in France, and we had just abandoned the little we had earned since. But we had not calculated our impatience to revisit our native land, had overbalanced every other consideration, and several amongst us soon found themselves in the greatest distress and want of everything. Although acquainted and even intimate with many of the great personages of the day, with your minister's sire, your counselors of state, and others, this circumstance gave rise to a bone mot from one of our wits, meeting one day in the saloon of the minister for maritime affairs of a friend who, like himself, hardly knew how to manage to subsist. He exclaimed by way of consolation, well, my friend, if we die of hunger, we may still have two or three ministers at our funeral. The emperor laughed heartily at the jest and admitted that it gave an exact description of the situation of affairs at that time. After his lesson of English and the conversation which followed, the emperor went out to take a walk. We walked to the end of the wood where the collage drove up to us. On the emperor's return, the doctor came to inform him that Colonel Reed, whom he had consented to receive in lieu of the governor, wished to be presented to him. Colonel Reed delivered to the emperor a note of considerable length, and I was sent for to translate it. It contained the communications which Sir Hudson Lowe had for three or four days past been vainly endeavoring to make in person. The note was couched in the most offensive terms, and the governor wished to have reserved to himself the satisfaction of communicating its contents to the emperor. Emperor, this is a characteristic trait, and it requires no comment. A note will be found among the official documents, and I shall recur to it whenever it produces any result. The harsh terms in which it was expressed, and in particular the repeated threat that we should be separated from the emperor, vexed us exceedingly and put us out of spirits for the remainder of the day. The fifth. 
at an early hour this morning, before I had risen, I heard someone softly open my chamber door. My apartment is so encumbered with my own bed and that of my son that it is no easy matter to enter it. I perceived a hand drawing aside my bed curtain. It was the Emperor's. I was reading a book of geometry a circumstance which amused him very much and as he said saved my reputation i instantly rose and soon rejoined the emperor who was proceeding to the wood alone he convened for a considerable time on the events of the preceding day he then returned to the house for the purpose of taking a bath. He was very ill and had passed a bad night. He sent for me at one o'clock. He was in the drawing room and he expressed a wish to take his English lesson. The weather was very hot and close. The emperor felt languid and dispirited. He could not bend his mind to study and several times fell asleep. At length he rose, saying he was determined to shake off his lethargy. And he proceeded to the billiard room to breathe a little fresh air conversing on the subject of the campaigns of Italy. He inquired what I had done with the first rough drafts. Observing that all the chapters had been several times recopied, I told him that I had carefully preserved them. He desired to have all the manuscripts brought to him, and laying aside two complete copies, he sent the rest into the kitchen to be burnt. I have already several times mentioned that the emperor knew I kept a journal. This was a secret, and therefore he never spoke to me on the subject except when we happened to be alone together. He often asked me whether I still continued my journal and what I could find to sit down in it. Sire replied, all that your majesty does and says from morning to night. Then said he, you must have a monstrous deal of repetition and must tell Mary many useless things. But no matter, go on, someday we will look it over together. When he visited my chamber, he frequently found the faithful Ali engaged in recopying my journal, for he had kindly offered to employ himself in this way during his leisure hours. The emperor sometimes cast his eye upon Ali's writing and after reading a few lines. That is to say, as soon as he ascertained what it was, he would turn away and speak about something else without ever alluding to the subject. This is precisely what had occurred this morning. And the emperor, recollecting the circumstance, said that he wished at length to have a sight of this famous jumble of trifles, my son brought a portion of the manuscript and the emperor spent upwards of two hours in perusing it. The introduction, which relates to myself personally, fixed his attention. He read it over twice and then said, Very well, this is a fine inheritance for little Emmanuel. As to the journal, he approved of its form. A general plan, he made several corrections with his own hand on those parts which related to his family and his childhood. He desired my son to take the pen, and he dictated to him some details respecting Brienne, Father Petrol. When he had done, he desired me to continue my labors, as he was pleased with them, and he promised to furnish me with many anecdotes, particularly concerning Alexander and the other sovereigns. He afterwards took a drive in the Kalash, in which I accompanied him, and the journal again became the topic of conversation. The ever said a great deal on the subject and expressed himself very much pleased with the idea. He gave me several hints respecting it and concluded by observing that from the beginning peculiar circumstances under which it was produced. It might become a work truly unique in its character and an invaluable treasure to his son. On our return to Longwood, we found the Grand Marshal who had just returned from Plantation House where he had been to hold a conference on the subject of the communications of yesterday. We anxiously awaited the answer he might bring back. He informed us that a proposition had been made, which was nothing less than that four of us should be separated from the Emperor. There were many other minor points of a very vexatious nature, but this one caused us to lose sight of all the rest the governor had however finally agreed to remove only the pole and three of the domestics according to the report of the grand marshal i was the individual upon whom the storm had lowered of whom the governor most particularly complained and whose removal he said he should certainly have decided upon had not he thought me too useful to the emperor he complained that i was constantly writing to europe the claiming against the government and the injustice and oppression which I alleged were exercised towards us. 
His other subjects of complaint were that I spoke of the emperor to the strangers who visited Longwood in such a way as to excite their interest, that I was constantly endeavoring to establish communications with different individuals on the island. And he mentioned the instance of Mrs. Sturmer that I had addressed or endeavored to transmit various documents to Europe. However, after having spoken of me in the most angry terms, for some reason or other, he endeavored to soften down what he had said by a few complimentary observations. He remarked that he could scarcely have expected such conduct in a man possessing so much information and whose good character was established throughout Europe. After dinner, the emperor amused himself by solving some problems in geometry and algebra. This, he said, reminded him of his youthful days, and it surprised us all to find that the subjects were still so fresh in his recollection. The 60th, the 7th. During these three, two days, a circumstance has occurred which is so nearly connected with the nature of the present work that I cannot omit noticing it. I mentioned a little further back that the emperor had expressed himself well satisfied with my journal. He alluded to it several times in the course of the day, assuring me that he should feel a great pleasure in perusing and correcting it. This information, as may be supposed, is highly gratifying to me. The moment which I had so long and ardently looked for at length arrived. That which I had hastily and perhaps inaccurately collected was now about to receive an inestimable correction and sanction and perfect points would be developed chasms filled up and obscurities explained what a fun of historical truths and political secrets was i about to receive elated by these expectations i the first day presented myself to the emperor at the usual hour having my journal with me but he began to dictate to me on a totally different subject and i was obliged to yield to the disappointment Next day, the same thing occurred again. I now wished to call the emperor's attention to my journal, but he did not appear to understand me, and I took the hint. I know Napoleon so well. He possesses in the highest degree the art of not seeming to understand. He resorts to it frequently and always for some particular object. In the present instance, I understood him sufficiently, and I did not again attempt to draw his attention to the subject. At first, I was much puzzled to get some motive that had induced him to act thus. And I made several conjectures, which have probably occurred to the reader as well as to myself. A few days afterwards, I was forced away from him, though I had not the least cause in the world to anticipate this fatal event. I have dwelt on this circumstance with scrupulous exactness, because I conceived it affords a new guarantee of my sincerity, and serves to explain precisely the nature of my journal, of the great bulk of its contents, and in particular the important events described in it. No doubt can be entertained. Some involuntary errors may, however, have crept into the details from the hasty manner in which they were collected and from my being deprived of the advantage of having the manuscript revised by the only individual who was capable of correcting its inaccuracies. The emperor, while he was dressing and waiting for the grand marshal to take his turn in writing, amused himself by conversing on different subjects. He spoke of the influence of opinion to which he so frequently alludes. He traced its secret progress, its uncertainty, and the caprice of its decisions. He then averted to the natural delicacy of the French, which he said was exquisite in matters of decorum, the laudable susceptibility of our manners, and the graceful action and gentleness of touch, which authority must employ if an attempt be made to interfere with the national feeling. In conformity with my system of certainty of amalgamating all kinds of merit and of rendering one and the same reward universal, I had an idea of presenting the cross of the Legion of Honor to Talma, but I refrained from doing this in consideration of our capricious manners and absurd prejudices. I wished to make a first experiment in an affair that was out of date and unimportant, and I accordingly gave the iron crown to Crescentini. The decoration was foreign, and so was the individual on whom it was conferred. This circumstance was less likely to attract public notice or to render my conduct the subject of discussion. At worst, it could only give rise to a few malicious jokes. Such, continued the emperor, is the influence of public opinion. I distributed scepters at will, and thousands readily bowed beneath their sway, and yet I could not give away a ribbon without the chance of incurring disapprobation, for I believe my experiment with regard to Crescentini proved unsuccessful. 
It did, sire, observed someone present. The circumstance occasioned a great outcry in Paris. It drew forth a general anathema in all the drawing rooms of the metropolis and afforded ample scope for the expression of malignant feeling. However, at one of the evening parties of the Faubourg Saint Germain, a bon mot had the effect of completely stemming the torrent of indignation a pompous orator was holding forth in an eloquent strain on the subject of the honor that had been conferred on Crestini. He declared it to be a disgrace, a horror, a perfect profanation, and inquired what right Crescentini could have to such a distinction. On hearing this, the beautiful Madame G, who was present, rose majestically from her chair, and with a truly theatrical tone and gesture exclaimed, Et sa blessure, Monsieur, how does this harm you, sir? Do you make no allowance for that? This produced a general burst of laughter and applause, and poor Madame G was very much embarrassed by her success. The emperor, who now heard this anecdote for the first time, was highly amused by it. He often afterwards alluded to it and occasionally related it himself. At dinner, the emperor informed us that he had worked for 12 hours, and we observed that his day was not yet ended. He seemed to us to be ill and fatigued. The eighth, when I entered the emperor's apartment this morning, I found him engaged in reading the files of Journaux de Debat, which had lately arrived. At three o'clock, he began to dress. His first valet de chambre was ill, and he observed that those who acted as his substitutes were not equal to him in a dress. The weather was tolerable, and we walked to the extremity of the wood, where the calash was to come take us up. I had a disposable sum of money in London, which I had conveyed thither in 1814. The recollection of the privations I had endured during my emigration and the chance of being exposed to future want had prompted me to this act of prudence, and I was now reaping the fruits of it. Owing to this circumstance, I was more at my ease as to pecuniary affairs than any other individual of the Empress Suite at St. Helena. But what led me to regard this sum as an inestimable treasure was the happiness of being able to lay it at the feet of the Emperor. I had already several times proposed that he should accept it. I now once more repeated the offer while I adverted to the renewed outrages which we had just experienced from the Governor. At this moment, we were joined by Madame de Montalon, who had set out after us. She observed that the emperor walked so fast that she should certainly have lost sight of him, had not my gesticulations enabled her to keep her eye upon us, and that she had been puzzled to guess the cause of my vehemence of manner. Madame, said the emperor with the most captivating grace, he has been trying to make me accept his bounty. He has been offering to support us here. We returned almost immediately to the house as the weather was very damp and the emperor complained of a toothache. For some time past, he had been troubled with a great secretion of saliva. After dinner, he resumed the reading of the Odyssey. We had arrived at the passage describing the combat between Ulysses and Iris on the threshold of the palace, both in the garb of beggars. The emperor very much disapproved of this episode, which he pronounced to be mean and congruous and beneath the dignity of a king. And yet continued he independently of all the faults which, in my opinion, this incident presents. I still find in it something to interest me. I fancy myself in the situation of Ulysses, and then I can well conceive his dread of being overpowered by a wretched mendicant. Every prince or general has not the broad shoulders of his guards or grenadiers. Every man has not the strength of a porter. But Homer has remedied all this by representing his heroes as so many colossi. We have no such heroes nowadays. What would become of us, he added, glancing round at us all, if we lived in those good times when bodily vigor constituted real power? Why, Novaris? His Willy de Chambre would wield a scepter over us all. It must be confessed that civilization favors the mind entirely at the expense of the body.